Welcome to the Wealthy Speaker Podcast. This is the podcast dedicated to people who want to speak more as a way to build their income and grow their business. Well, welcome everyone to the Wealthy Speaker Podcast. I'm your host, Jane Atkinson, and today's podcast is being brought to you by Accelerate Live 2018. We have this live event September 7th and 8th in Toronto that I think you are going to want to check out. We're doing deep dives on both sales and storytelling. One of our headliners is the fabulous Kelly Swanson, who is going to help you learn how to craft an awesome story and also how to add humor to your story. She herself is a hoot. I think you're really going to love this program. You want to check it out, go on over to speakerlauncher.com and check out our events page for more information. Now, today's podcast is called Insider Secrets of Best-Selling Authors. Ah! I'm so excited for you to meet our guest expert, Kate White. Welcome. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> Kate is not only a best-selling author, she's a writing superstar. She's uh, pumping them out. And she's also a valuable member of our speaking community. And um, Kate, let me just share with everybody your kind of formal bio, and then we're going to dive into the uh, behind-the-scenes parts, Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Kate White is the former editor-in-chief of five magazines, including Cosmopolitan, for 14 years. She's the nationally recognized authority on leadership, work, and success. She's a New York Times best-selling author, this is legit people, of several influential books for women on those topics, not was uh, on Amazon for one day. (laughs) Uh, Kate's business books include the new released newly released and number one Amazon bestseller, The Gutsy Girl Handbook, a totally revised edition of her groundbreaking 1990s Wall Street Journal bestseller, Why Good Girls Don't Get Ahead But Gutsy Girls Do. So you have this kind of gutsy girl theme, which is awesome. (laughs) She is also the bestselling author of 12 Murder Mysteries and Psychological Thrillers, which I personally am addicted to, uh, which have been published in 13 languages. And for those of you who write books, we know that this is a big deal. Um, Kate. Let's first dive into some juicy bits and pieces about your work at Cosmopolitan Magazine. Like, that must have been just an amazing time and experience. How do you look back on that now? Oh, Jane, it was 14 years of almost nonstop thrilling fun. (laughs) Oh, I'm glad you feel that way. It was really like being in a television show. There were days that I would be in my office. There might be male models running around with their shirts off and people like Ludacris or coming up to visit me. And just, it, it was so awesome. I loved every minute of it. Uh, I think it taught me a lot even Mm -hmm that I've taken on with me because Cosmo was a very well-defined brand. Right. Even before I got there, the mantra was fun, fearless female. And my duty was to take it into the 21st century, mm. which we did. Unlike a lot of other superstar magazine brands from the sixties, powerhouses like look and life, they didn't last. So I, I really felt good about being able to do that. The one thing I would say though, part of why I wanted to leave is that I could see the magazine business was in a death spiral. And I think no matter what we do as speakers, authors, whatever, we have to watch and listen these days because change is happening so fast. Don't let it scare you, but realize what seemed like a good idea to you three years ago that you put in your drawer, it just might not be valid today. Yeah. And I think that we as speakers, it's our job to really be looking across the horizon and seeing what is coming. We just had someone on the podcast. I think you're either a week before or a week ahead of him, Doug Hall, who was talking about virtual meetings and how you can tap into those and not be afraid of them. And I, I'm really excited that we're kind of trying to help prepare people in these ways uh, to not be fearful of the future, but to embrace it. 
Yes, I think a great management guru once said to me, it's like whitewater rafting. And you don't let yourself panic thinking too far ahead. You stay in the moment, you deal with it. One of the things Coswell taught me too is that popular culture is important to pay attention to. It was the first magazine I edited where I wasn't in the demographic. And a friend of mine said to me, oh, you know, what's it like to have to watch shows like you know, the OC or Gossip Girl. And see that, I would have been all over that. Yeah, yeah, what the heck? (laughs) And yet I found it kept me young. It Mm -hmm. kept me in tune with what was going on in the culture. And I still do a certain amount of that. It's really important. And I also advise people when I give career talks, don't just have mentors, have reverse mentors. Mm -hmm. Have 22-year-olds that you talk to And this is, if you're a speaker or a book author, you want to know what's coming down the road that you need to pay attention to. Right. And that's why as a speaker, you are out there delivering this really important information, not just for women, uh, but for business audiences. And your time at Cosmo was really um, so, you know, there are so many great tips that come out of that. We could talk for hours about that. But we talk, we're talking today about books. And how many total books do you have under your belt now? Well, I just handed in my 13th psychological thriller <sighs> mystery. Wow. I started the other one a couple of weeks ago. And I've done four career books. So it's it's heading towards 20, which you know, when you do one, you're so relieved. You wonder, how did I do exactly. it? Exactly. After the first one, I said, never again. Yeah. And then I can't do another. And then yeah. I do think to some degree, it's a little easier as you go on because you see that it's possible to go through that cycle. Right, right. So uh, let's first talk about the difference between fiction and nonfiction, because you've balanced that quite nicely. Not that, wouldn't you say that in your world, uh, the fiction authors rarely ever do non nonfiction? Yeah, you, like, you, right, you don't see too many, certainly in the mystery psychological world. Mm-hmm. I have a friend, Linda Fairstein, who's a very successful crime writer. She ran the sex crimes unit of the Manhattan prosecutor's office for many years. She is going to, uh, she's done a lot of writing. She wrote for me at Cosmo from the files of Linda Fairstein. And Lisa Scottolini writes humorous essays. She's a number one New York Times bestselling author of thrillers. So there is some degree of that, Mm -hmm. but there's such a difference. And you have to almost let something burn off when you go to write fiction because nonfiction is all about telling. I tell you what I know. I tell you what I think you might want to know. Mm-hmm. But fiction, as expression goes, is all about showing. You don't want to say things like, she feels sad. You want to convey that in her expressions, in her dialogue. And it's very tough sometimes when you first are making the transition to let go of the need to tell. Mm. How did you learn how to do that? Did you go, uh, were you a journalism major or what what led you in this direction? Well, Jane, you may remember this great newspaper, the Orville Street News. I put (laughs) that out when I was seven years old or five years old or something. It was never got shortlisted for a Pulitzer, but boy, it was good. Mm -hmm. It was a little newspaper I put out. And then in high school, I put out... (laughs) A variety of different. I wrote a play for my high school. I put out a little magazine. Oh and, my goodness! But I didn't know, Jane, that you have to, as you say, pick a lane. Right. What I did with writing. So when I went to college, I by that point thought I want to be in magazines. I won a great contest when I was in college called the Glamour Magazine Top Ten Women College Contest, right. College Women Contest. Right. And That was sort of my ticket to New York before internships. And it was only after I had been writing and working in magazines for quite a while, moving up as an editor, that I realized I didn't want to let go of that other thing to write novels, to write Mm. stories. And so I really tried to – I always advise people in my career talks to put time aside every week to think of the big picture, to drain the swamp as well as slaying the alligators – And it's great when you're running a business, but it's also good about your personal success too. Don't Mm. 
focus on the day to day. Put aside 30 minutes a week to think about your vision. Where are you? Are you where you want to be? Is it time for a change? And that was when I decided, you know, I want to do this other kind of writing too. But it took practice. I had to write a lot to burn off the need to tell. Hmm, that is so interesting. Uh, okay, so you talked about the 30 minutes a week to think about your business or your career. I think that is really, really great advice because so many people are just the businesses running them in our in our world of speakers, right? right? They don't stop to think about are, am I moving my am I moving it forward the way I want it to go. Um, let's talk a little bit about your book writing process. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, what do you do first? Well, first of all, this was a lot of trial and error for me because I wanted to write books in my 20s. And I could not get it off the ground. And to anyone out there who can't get it off the ground, do not think it's because you don't really want to write the book. A lot of it is figuring out what's the process that works for you or what I sometimes call because it sounds more appealing, the writer's cocktail. Oh, <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> but, yeah, but what's the mix that's going to work for you? Ah. For me, I began to realize that I, I needed to shorten the amount of time I planned to write. When I was a young journalist, I interviewed time management experts, and there was one guy who told me this great strategy called slice the salami. And he said that sometimes we don't do what we want to do because we make it too dawning. So you've got to slice that salami down. And I discovered that I needed to limit the amount of time I told myself I was going to write. So that was important for me. I also found that I needed a flat surface, not a busy roll top desk, which I had that drove me nuts. I needed for nonfiction. I could do it at night. I didn't mind the sound of old Law and, or Law, or Law and Order episodes going in the background. <laughs> My husband anchored an early morning newscast, so he was in bed, the kids were in bed, I was good to go. And Jack McCoy was like my muse. That guy, you know, uh, I, I loved there him. There are a lot of good lines on that show. Yeah, so and, just... and, and he helped me by keeping me up. But when I went to write fiction, I discovered couldn't write at night, had to do it early in the morning. Oh. But the bottom line is figure out what you need, what type of desk do you need sound or does it need to be quiet mm. do you need uh, to reward yourself every half an hour by saying this is when I can fix a, an espresso or give myself a piece of chocolate or a bicky <laughs> uh, whatever but experiment because you will find that some things make you more productive than others how do you um, how do you okay so you're a busy speaker how do you find the time to write? Let's talk about that. Well, that's tricky because even though I try now to write every day, I find that if I give don't do it on weekends, I, it's easy to kind of fall off. So I write every day. But when you're on the road, like I gave a speech a week or two in Buffalo. It was on a Saturday and you're, the plane was late and I didn't have the time when I got to the hotel to write like I thought I was going to, things get thrown off. Mm -hmm. But what I try to do is just think of it almost like medication that you didn't take one day. You don't necessarily say, okay, I'm going to take it at midnight. You get back to your routine the next day and do it. So I don't beat myself up if there's a day or two that I don't do it. But by having it blocked into the calendar every day, instead of being when I can grab a few moments, mm -hmm. right. I know that 8.30, I hit my desk to write. 8.30 At till when? I usually try to get there through lunch and then I save the afternoon for a call to the, the meeting planner to discuss mm -hmm. what, what we're going to be talking about, what the audience is going to be all about, or maybe they need me to send them a bio or I just got somebody today. Hey, we need more receipts from you for your taxis. And so <laughs> I try never to do that in the morning because that is the time. Prime. that that's prime writing time. And you don't have a problem going from 8.30 till 12.30. Like three and four hour chunks are probably good for you. Not anymore. but in As a professional writer. <laughs> well, but Jane, I'm telling you, I could do it when I worked at magazines. But when I had to write on my own, mm. I had to start with 15 minutes. That was, mm. I know that's pathetic. Uh -huh. That's the best I could do. 
And okay. then I moved up from there. And when you practice moving up, it gets easier and easier. Okay. But let me tell you, even to this day, if I see that rug pad is sticking out a little beyond the rug, I'm going to get up with a pair of scissors and I'm going to trim it. <laughs> <laughs> you um, find other things to d- distract uh, you is yeah, what you're saying? I, I still do. But yeah. I the trick, I think, is not to beat yourself up, to, but just to get back. Like when you're meditating, if your mind drifts, mm-hmm. you come back and you say, okay, let's get on board again. You know, you're going to write till noon today. Okay. So let's talk about the writing and editing part of the process, because I think a lot of people get really caught up in perfectionism and they just right. can't even finish a chunk. So let's talk about how do you... How do you write? Um, what's what's the writer's way to write? <laughs> well, I, I think all writers do it differently, but I try to polish as I go because that's the beauty of having a, a computer. But it can be really good to say, I'm going to do a draft of the entire chapter and then I'm going to go back and re- redo it. Okay. Because you can really get caught up in too much editing as you go that you never mm-hmm. get to the end. Yeah, I'm so, thinking, why Why do I keep changing every word? Is that really necessary? And I well, think yeah, it, it um, can become a I do set a deadline for myself to have the book done that would allow me then an, uh, another month or two to just go through from beginning to end. And I, just like you, I talk about the dangers of perfectionism sometimes when I'm counseling anyone or ta- giving a speech, but you here's, here's the little hitch with that. Okay. Today, to sell a book idea, it's got to be winning. And maybe the writing doesn't have to be absolutely perfect, but the topic has to be absolutely compelling. The title has to be absolutely compelling. So just as sometimes with fiction writers, they say, win them over in the first 50 pages, win them over on the first page, and maybe you don't have to worry about as much afterwards, but that's critical. In some ways, the same is true with a nonfiction book proposal. You got to hook them with that title right away, right. and then you've got to hook them with why it should be in the marketplace. And then if some of your, your, your you know, agonizing over some of the copy in chapter three, and you're going to send a certain number of chapters, maybe let that go a little bit. I'd focus on the front end if I were them, anybody trying to do this. All right. So uh, your process right now, uh, you've had an agent for a long time, likely, Mm -hmm. right? And a publishing house. Who do you you work with as your publisher? Uh, My agent is Sandy Dykstra. She's on the West Coast, but I picked her when I wrote a book that was a bestseller 23, 24 years ago called Why Good Girls Don't Get Ahead. Mm -hmm. And I picked her because she handled nonfiction. She actually does a lot of literary fiction, like Amy Tan and Lisa C are Mm -hmm. two of her clients, but she also didn't murder mysteries. And she didn't know that one day I was going to say to her, Sandy, I want to write a murder mystery. Wow. And when I, I'm like, what? But uh, she is on the West Coast. That's tricky because I think it's good to have an agent. She's a terrific agent. Mm-hmm. But I think it's good that when you're starting out, if you can have someone that you have access to, to some mm-hmm. degree, maybe at least one meeting in person. Now, if you're doing self-published, you don't necessarily, you don't need an agent, of course. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part of what people have to think about. You know, what do I want to accomplish with this book? Do I just want something to sell in the back of the room? Then, hey, then I can self-publish. Right. But if you want something that's going to really make a name for you that might uh, create uh, a higher stature for you, that might get buzzed about, Right. Then you do have to think about an agent because you cannot get nonfiction book published today in one of the major houses without an agent, and unless it it was a fluke situation. Gotcha. And um, for those of a lot of our listeners know who Kendra Hall is, and I think that you had given uh, Kendra a nice uh, introduction to her agent, and she's going to be writing. uh, Well, what I know will be a bestseller. Yeah, you know, I just I happen to. 
write to Kendra and reach out to her because I was such a fan. And I, I did say to her that I would be glad to recommend some agents to her. And there's one agent in particular who I love who, who does nonfiction. And one thing that can be tricky with an agent is some of them are better editors than others. Mm. And if you can find an agent who, who's going to guide you with what's wrong with your proposal. And a lot of times we don't want to hear that. Right. We want to think it's perfect. We already spent a year doing this stupid thing. We're ready to throw it in the river. Right. And all of a sudden you've got an agent saying, well, I like the general direction, but yeah, good agents can really help you, especially today because a lot of editors are acquiring agent uh, editors. But once your book gets in there, they're not necessarily going to help you with the title or, or much direction. A lot of them do very little editing, uh-huh. which, is, which is not only disappointing because everybody needs editing, but you might, that might be a phase where in the past, a good editor could have tweaked it just enough to say, why don't we go here with the title? And then you've got the totally winning formula. You've got to have a really finished product practically that you're presenting in terms of title and concept. So for those people who are kind of still on the fence about even writing their first book, what would you say to them about the importance of having a book? Well, certainly it does, I found, help you book speeches. I think a lot of people today, they like the idea that you will sell something in the back of the room. It adds to the carnival feeling of the event. (laughs) And I often have people before I can even raise the topic say, oh, are you going to want to sell books? Mm -hmm. So, I think it adds to that. It's great on your website and it just seems to add to your stature and your expertise that you've got a book. I don't know what self-published books do in that realm. I know that, you know, when I see a self-published book that someone's selling because of my background in publishing, that doesn't add to the author's stature for me that there's a self-published book, but to someone who doesn't know any better, it, it certainly could. Okay. But, but I but I do think books add credibility to you and right. they they can also be a way to make money. Yeah, for sure. And for those people who are really wanting to get their book out quickly, although would you say that the timelines with the publishing houses have shortened? I mean, they used to be pretty ridiculous, but yes. They tell well, you some? It, it's interesting that you say that because one of the bureaus I dealt with said, Kate, your last career book is now five years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was called, I shouldn't be telling you this. And I wrote it when I knew I would be leaving Cosmo. Right. And she said, it would be great to have another book to sell at the back of the room. And so I started thinking about the idea of re- doing something with Gutsy again, because I'd always thought the book would be obsolete one day, but it, but it isn't. And I said to my agent, what if I tried to quickly self-publish a book just for the back of the room? You you could tell she was about to need her smelling salts. (laughs) She was particularly concerned about, because she's such a great agent, Sandy Dykstra is, is more that it might hurt my stature in the publishing business if then I went and tried to get another major house deal. Mm -hmm. So she really guided me to think in terms of, let's let's leave that as a last resort. And when we approached my old publisher with the idea of, can I use the word gutsy without a problem from you guys? They said, why don't you do the revise the book for us? Mm. Uh, and they basically had the same idea I did. So it worked out great. Oh, good. And, and that, that was good. Uh, but part of the reason I wanted to self-publish to answer your question before I was rambling on here like that <laughs> uh, is that I, I didn't want it to take forever. Yeah. And, well, and what is it norm like 18 well, or something from it start? ended up, I handed the book in, in April and it came out the following April. Okay. So that was pretty good. And they knew that was part of what I wanted to do. But I think today, if they think 
you have a hot topic. They'll push it. They know it, it, those things can be tired, become mm-hmm. tired so quickly that they'll go for it. But if it's evergreen, you might you might not have that happen. I think and, the uh, publishing houses are very um, smart to see professional speakers as um, the the sellers of books that they are, especially like the Kendra Halls and the Ryan Estes, who are out there with thousands and thousands of people in their audiences every year uh, that they can sell to in advance. Right. So, Jane, you brought up such a good point because right now it's the buzz word is pre-orders. Mm. The best group to market to are the people who you've harvested their email addresses. Mm-hmm. Twitter doesn't really matter. Facebook doesn't really matter. Facebook's more difficult now, as we all know. Mm-hmm. And Instagram, certainly that gets the book out there. And they say sometimes people have to have seen the name of a book maybe 12 times before they buy. Right. But the people who are percentage-wise more likely to order are the people who are already fans. They get your newsletter. Right. So what somebody like a Ryan or a Kendra or any of uh, some of the great people that you've showcased can do is they, are, they already have a, a fan base and mm-hmm. they're going to be able to email those people and say, guess what? My book is coming out, yeah. which is so important. So even if you're not thinking of doing a book quite yet, be building that email list Send out your newsletter because those are the people who, when you do decide to book, get a book, will be your first um, uh, customers. And uh, my goal is for our clients to be selling the book in advance of every event. I mean, you probably aren't schlepping books to um, events, but your goal is to have you know the book in the hand of every member of the audience yes and i i've heard dan pink say he does this that sometimes you you take the job only for book orders Mm -hmm, right what i did lately i lowered my price a little bit in exchange for buying a book for every table yeah And then there was a huge line for people to sign it later Mm -hmm. and it created a certain amount of buzz and other people were writing down the name of the book to buy. Yeah. I do think it really adds something to the party. Wonderful. Um, When is your next uh, mystery book coming? Because I'm really dying to get it. It'll be out next March. And what's it called? uh, I haven't picked a title yet. Oh. <laughs> that actually, I just want to circle back to something. Sure. Love the time. You said something so important to me when uh, at one point, and I've loved working with you. Uh, you said you got to pick a lane as a speaker. Mm-hmm. You have to pick a lane as an author too. Mm-hmm. And you just can't be too broad. And this was what we had to do with Cosmo cover lines. Yeah, I'm the woman who used to write those lines like, mattress moves so hot his thighs will go up in flames. (laughs) Uh, I also told my kids, oh, mommy doesn't work on those lines. Those lines (laughs) are written someplace else and attached to the magazine that mommy does. But you need to pick a lane and you want to do something that with cover lines, we used to say, find the intersection where the universal meets the specific. Oh, and that's a place where you're tapping into a need that is compelling because ultimately, as a book author, you've got to be bringing a benefit to someone. There's got to be a purpose to what you're doing. Mm-hmm. But you want to have a specificity that makes a person think, how does she know? Years and years ago, I once saw a cover line that I coveted because it was so good. And it, it, you're, it, it's a little lame, you might think, but to me as a cover line writer, it was great. Instead of nine ways to beat stress or the 11 best stress busters, mm-hmm. it was what to do when stress keeps you up at night. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's the perfect example of the universal with the specific, right. because it said, I know it's not just stress that's bothering you. It keeps you up at night and you can't get back to sleep. That's and then really you good. Can, 
how do they know? So think about what you have to say, the message that you can bring. Maybe it emanates from a story in your own life as a speaker, even before that, the the business you're in, what's that? And, and what are the things you find resonate for people? Start writing those things down and then start to see if you can craft them into a sentence that says, here's the dominant message I'm going to bring to people. And what could be the title of that. And always in the magazine business, you value clear over clever. We tried to get clever, but Uh, we started with clear. Clear over clever is something that I've been adopting, but I didn't have that really clever way of saying it. Clear. Uh, Another good thing to do as a nonfiction author Mm -hmm. is to just look at the nonfiction Times bestseller list because you'll see everything on there has a specificity to it. Right. That's that's really brilliant. And you just go, okay, I get the benefit right away when I look at this title and it's specifically for me. Right. And even sometimes the very specific needs serve a lot of people. And, you know, even though you have written all of these mysteries, when you're talking about your speaking career and on that website, there is a very different bio and everything. It's all business, business, business. And so I just want to make that clarification for people because we're talking about picking a lane. You've straddled uh, the mystery and the business um, quite nicely. Uh, I mean, how hard has that been for you? Well, see, I think it's nice that you say that, Jane. <laughs> I would say to somebody, do as I say, not as I do in that regard, because brand should really be tight. You, you should be on brand. You should pick your lane as Jane advises and stay <laughs> with it. I actually even did a program at Harvard Business School, the executive education program. It was my going away gift from Cosmo, from my boss. And everyone got to bring one issue. My issue was, what do I do with these two weirdly different bifurcated things? I write freaking murder mysteries, and I'm a career expert speaker. And I kept them separate because I tried to merge them and it didn't merge. Yeah. So katewhitespeaks.com is for the career and speaking. katewhite.com is for the mystery. And it's not an ideal thing, but I couldn't figure out a way to blend the two. And if you had your time back all the way before you wrote your first mystery, would you use another pen name? No, I wouldn't have done that. But let's okay. say I was the editor of Red Book when I decided I'm going to make this mystery writing thing happen mm-hmm. before I run out of time. Yeah. I'm going to start at the 15 minutes a day and I'm going to do it and I'm going to ignore the rug pads. I'm <laughs> just going to do it. Um, I got the job as the editor of Cosmo shortly thereafter. And maybe what I would have done is said, okay, how am I going to be on brand? What's my lane here? My lane at is kind of over the top. It's, um, you know, juicy, it's sexy, not personally, (laughs) but certainly uh, the magazine. And maybe I would have written a type of fiction that more aligned with that. Right. But I love doing it. I love the, the mystery element. And so I do find at least the people who hear me speak on career and success and leadership, they're very curious how I did both. How, how did I run the number one magazine brand for women in the entire world and find the time to write mysteries? That at least makes them raise their hand at the end of the speech. And the first question is, how did you do both? Yeah. So, it, it you know, it, it lines up a little bit. That's wonderful. Wow. Um, What's on the horizon for uh, Kate White? Well, I just, uh, having gotten this last book in and told that they really like it, uh, I I did do a little editing from my editor, but they're very happy and that'll be out next April. Great. Uh, I started a new psychological thriller that I'm just in love with early on before the self-loathing sets in. (laughs) A lot. It's like having a crush on your plot and your character. <laughs> and then, Jane, um, you know, I would love 
to do as much speaking as I, I can. Mm. I don't know why I think any of us who get up and aren't terrified completely about speaking, who love doing it, we wonder why. This is something those polls say, say mm-hmm. people fear more than death, but yeah. I'm not one of those people. I love no. doing it. That's good. That's good. Well, um, for those of you who are listening and we have some Bureau listeners, definitely check out katewhitespeaks.com and uh, you've got a demo reel up there and some information about your presentations. And I'm excited to catch up with you, Kate. I miss you and I hope that we get to hang out again really soon. Well, thanks so much. You know, I'm such a big fan. I listen to every podcast. Ah. I was thrilled when I was asked, and I, I've loved working with you. I really loved going to your university and working <laughs> with a small group of other authors. It was a really fun weekend for me. Oh. Very, very strong experience. So awesome. I, I, I thank you so much, Jane. Well, thank you. And for those of you listening in, please leave us a rating, leave us a comment, let us know. Uh, what you thought of today's episode and what most resonated for you in the information. And uh, we'll be coming back to you with more great information to help you build your speaking business. And for that, we'll say, uh, see you soon, wealthy speakers. Bye for now, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Wealthy Speakers Show. Please visit speakerlauncher.com for your free wealthy speaker audit and visit speakerlauncher.com forward slash podcast for show notes and many more resources to help you catapult your speaking business. See you soon, wealthy speakers.